Messenger International presents The Bait of Satan Curriculum, a 12-part series designed to free you from the snare of offense. In Lesson 1, John lays a basic foundation for the series, describing what offense actually is, why we're more offended with our pastors, spouses, and friends than others, how God feels about it, and why it's important to forgive. All right, I'd like you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to two places. Find Luke, the 17th chapter, and then go ahead and put a marker in Matthew, chapter 24. That's Luke 17 and Matthew chapter 24. And as you know, we are going to be doing 12 30-minute sessions, roughly 30 minutes, a little bit less, on the bait of Satan. Now, in Luke 17, I want to begin here and just read one verse. We're going to kind of backtrack in this scripture here. In verse 5, we read, And the apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. Now, this is the latter part of Jesus' ministry. And you have to understand, these guys have seen him raise the dead. They've seen him open up the eyes of the blind. They have seen him open up the ears of those who were born deaf. They have seen him cause the cripple to walk. They have seen him feed 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fishes. They've watched him calm a life-threatening storm. But yet none of those miracles caused them to cry out and say, Lord, we can see there's a lot of doubt and we need more faith. What I want to ask is, what was it that caused these disciples to say, Lord, increase our faith. Now, I'm going to be real honest with you. These guys just didn't say, Jesus, please increase our faith. I believe that if you were actually standing there, Jesus makes a statement to them. And after he makes this statement, they go, Lord, increase our faith out of desperation. What was that statement? Go back to the third verse and you're going to see it. Jesus said, take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Now look at verse 4. And if he sins against you seven times in a day. Wow. And seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent. You shall forgive him. And then the Lord, the, the disciples cried out, Lord, increase our faith. So it wasn't the miracles. It was when Jesus simply said, whenever your brother sins against you, you forgive him. Now, Jesus makes this statement in the first verse. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Everybody say offenses. offenses. Now, offense in the Greek is, the, is an old Greek word, and that is scandalon. Everybody say that with me, scandalon. Now, that's an old Greek word that was used to describe the bait stick of a trap that hunters would use to catch small animals and birds in. The hunter would place the bait on the scandalon, the bait stick, which we would call it today, and the animal would take, or the, or the bird would take the bait, and the cage would close and either capture it or kill it. Thereby, an offense is the bait of Satan to pull you, the believer, into his captivity. Are you seeing this? Now, Paul confirms this when he writes to Timothy. I'm going to read to you out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through 26. Paul says, And the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all able to teach and patient in humility correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may come to know the truth now listen to verse 26 this is 2nd Timothy chapter 2 verse 24 through 26 and he says and that they may come to their senses everybody say come to their senses <laughs> and escape the trap or snare of the devil having been taken captive by him the devil to do his will. So Paul says those who are in opposition, those who are offended with one another, are taken captive of Satan to do his will. Now the scary thing is, is most people that are in the trap of offense don't even know it. Because that's what Paul says, that they may come to their senses. If they knew they were in the devil's trap, they wouldn't stay there. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen right now. Are you getting this? Yes. So the thing that I found, now I've preached this message all over the world. I've preached it in conferences and churches in every continent except Antarctica. I haven't preached the penguins yet. But anyway, 
I found out something that most people that are offended don't even realize they're offended. In every conference that I preach this message in, 50 to 80 percent of the people respond saying, I'm offended, and most of them say they didn't even know it until the truth came out. Are you with me? You see, a hunter, in order to catch prey, has to lay a smart trap. You make the trap obvious, you're not going to catch anything. If you go down there and jump, if you jump into the water when you got a hook in your hand, you got some bait and say, hey, fish, I'm coming to catch you, he's not going to pay any attention to you. If you walk out to your trap and you put that thing in there and you make the thing obvious, the animal's not going to take it. Satan's no different. He's very cunning. He's very, he's very, very cunning, very shrewd. And he knows the very way that he can get you into his captivity is not going to be by a blatant, obvious trap. It's going to be by something very subtle. And it's called offense. Everybody say being offended. being offended. That is the bait. Now, turn with me, please, to Matthew, the 24th chapter. Matthew 24. Now, in Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking about the last days. Let me ask you this, church, this morning. How many of you believe we're living in the last days? Can I see your hands? Okay, this is something that we do not have to labor about this morning, correct? I mean, we are living in the days and the season of his return. Now, the, the apostles or the disciples said to Jesus, they said to him, what's going to be some of the signs of your second coming? What's going to be the evidence that you're really coming back? And Jesus begins to list certain things that were going to happen in the earth, among God's people. And one of the signs that he listed, I find is so interesting, is found in the 10th verse. He said, and then many. Everybody say many. many. Now the Greek word for many there is the Greek word P-O-L-U-S, which means this, much, many, and great. This word in no way implies a few or some. It means a very large part of something. You got it? So what he is indicating here is it's going to be a very large amount of people. Now, I can say that I have seen this fulfilled because in all the conferences that I've preached at all over the world, I told you 50 to 80% of the people respond. So look what he says. And then many will be offended. Everybody say offended. offended. Will betray one another and will hate one another. Now, this is a progression. An offense will lead to a betrayal. And a betrayal, if it is not dealt with, will ultimately lead to hatred. You say, now where do you get that from? Proverbs chapter 18, verse 19 says this. You can look it up later, just write it down. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Let me say that again. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city. Now, in the days of Solomon who wrote the book of Proverbs, what did strong cities have around them, folks? Walls. What were walls built for? Come on, you're saying it. Protection, right? Those walls were built to keep out those people that you thought were against you. And they were also built to allow those people that you thought were for you in. Correct? So what Solomon is saying is, as a brother that is offended is harder to win than a strong city. He's saying that brother has built walls. Now, the New Testament does not call them walls. The New Testament calls them strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3, 4, and 5 says this, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. How many of you know we're in a war? Yes. Come on, I'm glad a third of you know that. How about the rest of you? Yes. How many of you know this is not a playground? This is a battleground. Yes. Too many people wearing a dress right now instead of putting on armor. Amen? Yes. They're talking about flying away when God's saying, get ready for war. Yes. Good preaching. Amen. I'll help you this morning. Yes. just want to make sure you're here, all right? Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, he goes on to say, are not carny, carnal or fleshly, but they are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Everybody say strongholds. strongholds. Now, are those strongholds devils in the atmosphere? No. Now, that is a valid teaching. Ephesians chapter 6, there is a validity in that, but that's not what we're talking about. That's not what Paul's talking about right there. He goes on to tell what those strongholds are. In the very next verse, verse 5, he says this, casting down every imagination, and the literal renders it this, every reasoning. Yes. Casting down every reasoning. Everybody say reasoning. reasoning. Now, where do reasonings occur? Point to your head. 
casting down every imagination or reasoning and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Everybody point to your heads. Where's knowledge? Oh, man, you're getting it. And then he says, listen, bringing every thought. Everybody say thought. thought. Where do thoughts occur? Everybody point your head. Isn't this interesting? And bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So now, folks, what are strongholds? Strongholds are reasonings, are thought processes that are contrary to the will of God. Amen. Good preaching. I'm helping you this morning. We're waking up on this nice Sunday morning. Amen. Now, listen. I know what it is. You're listening real good, but I'm just trying to get you to laugh because I find that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Amen. I found out God can do things in your life. He can bring correction in your life and spank you in your life and give you some honey to go with it. it makes it a little bit nicer. <laughs> Thought processes or reasonings are these strongholds that are contrary to the will of God, to the word of God. Now, God's word is, listen, is a reflection of his nature. Now, God's nature is love. Everybody say he is love. The Bible does not say he has love. He is love. Amen. Good preaching. Amen. Now listen, the love of God always seeks to give, give, give. Are you with me? Yes. How many of you remember when you first got born again? Can I see your hands? I remember when I first got born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, I laughed and I sang all the way home from the meeting. I woke up the next morning with a smile on my face for the first time since I'd been a kid at Christmas time. I was so in love with everybody. I mean, I don't care who you were. I was in love with you. I mean, you loved everybody. You remember? You even loved your mother-in-law. You remember that? <laughs> Are you with me? And then what happened? Somebody did something to you that was not kind. Or they said something to you it was not kind or actually it was hurtful they gossiped about you they spoke against you now it wasn't a sinner it was somebody in the church you see I have discovered something and it's really not that big of a discovery the person who can hurt you the most is the person that is closest to you why is that because our expectation is higher upon them are you with me? Yes. If we set up expectations on people, then if they don't meet them, they've offended me. Are you with me? Yes. That is why the one who can hurt you the most is not somebody that's a sinner, but somebody that's in the world, or somebody that's in the church. And even more so, a husband, a wife, or a pastor. Because our expectations are higher. David said it like this in Psalm 55. He says this in verse 12 through 14. For it is not an enemy who reproaches me. Then I could bear it. Nor is it one who hates me who has exalted himself against me. Then I could hide from him. But it was you, a man my equal, my companion, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and we walked into the house of God and throne. This is a guy he's saying I went to church with, I sat next to, the word of God ministered to both of us. He was my brother. You're the one that's lifted up yourself against me. He said I could have handled it a lot easier if it would have been somebody in the world. That's right. that's Are you with me? Yes. See, because the one who can hurt you the most is the one who's closest to you because your expectation's higher. See, let me show it to you like this. Let's say this is zero expectation, all right? Our expectations on the world are probably about this high. Our expectation on our, our Christian brothers and sisters is about this high. Are you with me? Our expectation on our husband or wife is about this high, and our expectation upon our pastor is about this high. Are you getting this? So now listen carefully to me. If somebody only does this much, well, guess what? If he's a sinner, he's been a blessing to you because he's exceeded your expectation. Hello? Now, if somebody only does this much and they're in the church and your expectation was here, they've offended you by that much. If your wife or husband's only done that much and your expectation's here, woo, they've really offended you. If your pastor has only done this much, if he didn't shake your hand this morning when you left the church, if he didn't recognize your prophetic gift, then guess what? The offense is that big. It's huge. 
That's why most offended people today in the church, you know what they say? Now listen, man, I've been preaching on this for almost 10 years. You know what they say? Well, you know the world treats me better than most Christians. Yeah. Well, that's right. Because their expectation was only that in the world, and the world did that much, and they were like, well, they're nice to me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> All right, now. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Now, remember, I said it's a progression. The offended person is a person who builds walls. Now, those walls are up, so guess what now? They're no longer seeking to give, give, give. The walls now are seeking, are getting them to seek to protect, protect, protect. The focus is no longer now to give. The focus now becomes protect what I got. Now, what they become is like the Dead Sea in Israel. How many of you know there's two seas in Israel? Let me see your hands. Two seas that are, that are surrounded by the landmass of Israel. You have the Sea of Galilee and you have the Dead Sea. Now, the Sea of Galilee is up north and it receives waters that originate up in the mountains near Caesarea Philippi. They flow down into the northern part of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee freely takes in in the northern part, but it also freely gives out in the southern part. Freely it receives, freely it gives. The result is the Sea of Galilee is loaded with life. I mean, marine life, all of that, it's loaded. Now, the same living waters that come out of the Sea of Galilee flow down the River Jordan and enter into the northern part of the Dead Sea. But the Dead Sea only takes in, it doesn't give out. The result is every bit of life that comes into the Dead Sea dies because it hangs on to what it's got. Remember Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give? You want to really enter into life? Release the life that God's given you and you'll enter into life. But you see what happens is the offended person says, I've been hurt and I don't want to get hurt again. So now these mechanisms go up in their mind, in their thoughts, deep in their subconscious. I've been hurt, I'm not going to get hurt again. So they develop these thought patterns, these reasonings that are mechanisms to protect them from getting hurt again. So now we respond a little differently. We respond around the church. We respond in the church. We, we, we're quick to go to another place. Why? Because we don't, we've been hurt in that pl place. We don't get hurt again. We'll get into all that later. So now listen to me. A person now that has the walls up is a perfect candidate for betrayal. Now let me say this. Most people I find in the church today don't even know what betrayal is. They know a very limited aspect of what betrayal is, I should say. When people hear the word betrayal, you know what they think? They think Judas. All right? Are you with me? Yes. Let me tell you what betrayal is. Betrayal is when I seek my protection or my benefit at the expense of one I have a relationship with. Can I say that again? Yes. A betrayal is when I seek my protection or my benefit at the expense of one I have a relationship with. A betrayal is the ultimate abandonment of a relationship. And if a betrayal is not repented of, it will completely sever a relationship. Are you with me? When I have built walls, if push comes to shove, if situations get a little rough, I'm going to seek to protect myself. I don't care at the expense of who else. Are you with me? Proverbs 18, verse 1 says this, A man who seeks his own desire rages against all wise judgment. The man who has built walls will seek his own desire. Therefore, he will betray if push comes to shove. And if there is a betrayal in a relationship, it will ultimately lead to hatred. Now listen carefully to me. The Bible says you hate your brother, you're a murderer. I want to make sure that's settled in. Can I give you the prescription reference on that one? The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, whoever hates his brother, everybody say brother. So you can see very clearly John is not talking to sinners. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. It doesn't say he's like a murderer. It says he is a murderer. Sure is quiet now. Are you still here? Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
Is that clear? Amen. I'm glad it's clear to one person. Is it clear to the rest of you? Yes. Now, let me say this about hatred. You know what people think of when they think of hatred? They think of real rage and anger. That's not, that's not necessarily hatred. The Bible says that Absalom hated Ammon. These are two of David's sons. And you know what the Bible says? He neither spoke good to him nor evil to him. He controlled his hatred. Hatred means love less, means have no love. It is the void of having the love of God. Are you getting this? See, go meditate. Everybody listen to me. Go meditate on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. Meditate on those verses. You know, I don't know about you, but something that I have wanted to excel in, especially in the last couple of years, and especially in the last six months, is the love of God. I mean, I am so drawn to the love of God. It is the most powerful force in the whole universe. And I am convinced that the church that Jesus is coming back for is a church that is going to walk in exceptional, extravagant love. Amen. Amen. Hatred is not seen necessarily by emotions, by words. It can be, of course, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. However, it can be cleverly disguised. I'll never forget the time that the Lord exposed the hatred that was in my heart or in my mind or emotions, whatever. You, there was a certain person I didn't like. And the Lord said to me, he said, how would you like to live right next door to her in heaven? When he did, I went ballistic. I said, no, she needs to be on the other side. Well, then I realized I had an offense, and that offense went further. Are you with me? Yes. We'll talk about that later. Are you still here? Yes. Okay, I just want to make sure. Now watch this. Verse 11. Then, everybody say then. Yes. Now listen, what does then mean? It means after there's massive offense, and much of the offense turns into betrayal and hatred. All right? See, listen. There are stages you go through. Some of you I may be talking to right now, you may only be at the initial stage of fence. Some of you may have gone to the stage of betrayal. Some of you may be at the stage of hatred. And then Jesus says, after this, after you got a lot of offended people, he said, many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Now look up at me. Notice he's saying here that after there's massive offense, there's going to be a lot of deception. Do you know what the first thing Jesus says to these guys when he says, what's going to be the sign of your second coming? The first words out of his mouth is, be careful that nobody deceives you. In other words, deception is going to run rampant. If you look in the book of Timothy, Paul says there's going to be people in the church in the last days that are not only going to be deceiving people, but they're going to be deceiving themselves. An offended person deceives himself. What Jesus is telling us here is, is that offense is the breeding ground for deception. Now, you know what the problem with deception is? There's only one problem, and that is this, it's deceiving. In other words, a person who is deceived really believes he's right, when in reality he's wrong. That's the only problem with it. Now, what, what, what did Jesus call false prophets? Come on. Come on. Somebody should know this. Matthew 7, 15, what do you call false prophets? Wolves in sheep's clothing. Now notice he doesn't say they are wolves in shepherd's clothing. Everybody's always looking for the false prophet behind the pulpit. Now listen, they may be there, but I find there's a whole lot more false, listen, false prophets out there than here. That's a true statement. That's not a biased statement. They're in the salons, they're in the grocery stores, they're everywhere telling people, you should have heard, you, you can't believe what Pastor did. Now, you preach it. <laughs> now listen, listen, listen to me now. We're having a revival over here. I'll lean over here, okay? <laughs> now listen to me. I've learned that these predators, I'm talking about like wolves, hyenas, they travel in packs. Oh, we're getting it now. Okay, now listen, they have a goal. Do you know what their goal is? To isolate the sheep from the herd. 
There is protection for the sheep in the herd. But if they can get the sheep to separate from the herd, they're now meat for their table. Proverbs 18.1, a man who isolates himself, seeks his own desire, and rages against all wise judgment. The scary thing is this. You can be in a huge church. You can have a huge family. But the isolation doesn't occur outwardly. It eventually results in outwardly. Where it begins is right here. Strongholds. Now you are candidate for deception. Remember, deception doesn't come with a black cape. It comes as with angels' clothing. With believers' clothing. Are you still here? Yes. Verse 12, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Everybody say, the love of many. The love of many. You know what's really scary? The Greek word there for love is not the Greek word phileo. Phileo is the love that everybody has, world and sinner and Christian alike. It means brotherly affection. There is a Greek word used for love called agape. Agape is the love of God. The world does not have it. Jesus says this is the, world, this is the love the world cannot receive. This is the love that is shed abroad in a believer's heart when he is born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. The word that he uses there is agapeo. What Jesus is saying in the last days, the massive offense is not going to be in society only, but what he's talking about here, he said it's going to be within the church. And he said the love of many is going to grow cold, wax cold. It means the fiery, passionate love of God in your heart is going to become very cold, and it's a gradual thing. Listen, you put a frog in a kettle, and that kettle is room temperature, and you turn on the fire, and you boil that water, that frog will sit there and die. He will not jump out, even though he can. If you did it, if you, if you threw him into boiling water, he would jump out. But let me tell you something. When the love of God begins to grow cold, it's a growing. It's not an instant. You don't notice it. Keep yourself from offense, because it's massive, it's rampant. And Jesus said that it would occur massively in the last days. That's why you're sitting through this course, to hear the word of God to protect you. Amen? Amen. God bless you. What if Joseph had not trusted God's promise? If instead he had gotten bitter, started complaining, and putting up walls, what then? This and more is discussed by John Bevere in Lesson 2 of The Bait of Satan. Coming up next.